Let me say good evening to everyone again and welcome to our study session. I am beginning to lose track of the number now. I think it should be session eight. I hope I'm correct. I believe that you would have done your homework. I gave you a homework assignment. I believe you're good students. You will read those two parables that I told you to read from Matthew chapter 21 and chapter 22 because they're going to have somewhat of a connection what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight in relation to another perspective on Revelation chapter 13 and what it represents. And then I also have assigned you the task of reading um, Revelation chapter 17 because it is also connected to Revelation chapter 13 and it introduces um, another character which we will have to get the correct interpretation of because it is also connected to understanding what Revelation 13 is also trying to say to us. Now I'm going to do a brief recap again to make sure that we are tying things together. It, I think it's very, very important because this is very heavy stuff. It's very symbolic. It's filled with a lot of figurative language. And very important that we get a good foundation established so that we don't run ourselves into any difficulties in trying to, to comprehend what the word is saying to us. We should be clear in our minds that the book of Revelation is not something coming from the mind of John. Chapter one, I introduce you to the parallel tells us that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it for his angel unto his servant John. That's first chapter, the first verse, establishing the fact that it's really the revelation coming from Christ. And we establish the point, which you must bear in mind, that's very significant, that John is just the spray. So he's not coming up with these images. He's not um, coming up with these symbols. It's strictly the language coming from Christ, which was sent in signs and symbols for John to record and to share with the seven churches in Shemina. We established the fact as well that the, the Prologue indicated that there were things that were to shortly come to pass. Mentioned in verse one, and then in verse three, it says the time is at hand. So we, we cannot interpret Revelation strictly by looking at it as a book for the future. There have to be things in it that are related to John's time if they're to shortly come to pass, and if the reference to time is at hand, it is relevant. And we also indicated that since John was going to be sending these, this letter to the churches in, in Yeshua, there will have to be things in it that will be relevant to them. I, I personally believe that the book of Revelation is just not going to be dealing with the past. I believe that it will have some connection as well to our future. And that people of all times, in John time and in our time, will have some connection to the book of Revelation because there are spiritual implications. And there is a, is a deep message beyond just trying to understand what the symbols mean and what individuals they point to or what nations they point to or what specifically the symbol may represent. Spurgeon indicates that if our time is, is just spent on trying to decide who is right with their individual interpretation, we, we miss the whole purpose of what God intends in Revelation, in, in that he's given us an understanding of his purpose for the church and the experiences we're going to go through in our conflict evil, the satanic forces represented by the dragon and the beast, and the fact that we can overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. 
and by our connection and commitment to Christ, having his seal in our lives and not following the, the mark of the beast, which we will get a little more understanding of, we can be overcomers, we can triumph, we can be victorious, we can reach the eternal destiny which God, which God has designed for us. So the book has an overall message, the spiritual implications, and we will try to make sure that as we, we try to understand the symbols, because this is part of, of the, the whole way in which we go about hermeneutics. We get what the symbols represent, but we have to make an application. Very often the application, which is the spiritual application, is very much more significant than even just figuring out the symbols and the people they represent or the times they represent. That's what it all message. If any of you would have done George Orwell's book, I know Farm, those of you who are English students, you recognize that he, he used animals to portray a particular message which he was he was giving. And yes, you will understand what the animals represent, and you can follow the storyline based on the animals, because it was an animal satire, but you have to have an understanding of what he was really trying to teach. And he was looking at a system of government, socialism. And if you just understood what the animals were about, but you didn't get the whole message, then you would miss the essence of what um, we was trying to point out. In the same way, Revelation, the different is, that Orwell was dealing with something that was specific to be represented in his time, and it is not prophetic. The revelation is prophetic in a sense because what John was shown were things that were to come to pass shortly in his time, but of course, there are things that were even transcend his time. But I just do that you know, to your understanding because some of you are familiar with the book and you understand the significance of using animals to represent something that is given a larger picture. So Jesus gave John these symbols in the form of a dragon, beast, or prophet, which people often refer to as a holy trinity. And, and that, that or holy trinity is fighting the game. It's the holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so John is telling a story. There's a, there's a drama which unfolds in the symbols that he has been given. And yes, so to understand the drama, to be able to follow the, the, the storyline, we have to understand what the symbols mean. And that's the significance of them, that relevance of the symbols. I also mentioned to you that there's an important symbol which you must get to understand. That's the symbol of the, of the woman. Have the beast, which a lot of people pay attention to, the dragon, the false prophet. But there is the woman. And I give you the whole assignment. I want you to read chapter 17 because that introduced us uh, to the woman. We're going to pick up in chapter 12 to see where the, the woman was first introduced to us. Chapter 17 is just continuing a description, but we will pick up from chapter 12. But also be reminded that the, the, the book of Revelation is giving us symbols which have application, which have meaning, which, yes, represent people, places, and events. And for us to get the, the full drama understood and what story is being revealed to us, yes, we have to understand the meaning of the symbols. We have to have accurate interpretation. The issue here is that we do not write through the book have definitions of what each of the symbols represent. There are places where we are given an understanding of what some of the symbols will represent. For the most part, we are interpreting symbols. As a result, 
you're going to get people to come up with different interpretations. We all say that we're led by the spirit, and the spirit reveals things to us. But the reality is that very often man comes into play at his own um, experiences, his own ideology, his own theological perspective. Sometimes all things are superimposed his views, and this is why we're going to get variations. As per John Paul, so we should not be putting the main emphasis on trying to prove who is right and who is wrong, but trying to understand as we combine the interpretations. Because I believe that insight is going to come um, from different interpretations. And the Spirit is going to give different understanding and revelation in certain areas, which we can combine to get a fuller understanding of, of the story. So it's, it's, it's not trying to establish who is right and who is wrong, but to look to get a proper understanding of, of what the symbols are, are saying to us. I indicate that we have basically three positions when it comes to interpreting chapter 13 and 17 and, and other parts. But we can't do a whole study of the book of Revelation because it would take us too long. So we're going to have to pick out specific sections which help us understand the drama, the storyline. Because the Bible itself has a, a story from Genesis to Revelation. And there's a lot of drama that unfolds in that story. And we have to understand a lot of prophecy. We have to understand a lot of history. We have to understand a whole lot of what is presented to us in the 66 books for us to get the, the full story of what God is trying to show us. And it's not difficult if we pay very careful attention to how it unfolds and the students of the word, because the Bible says to us that we have to study the word to show ourselves who. I started by giving you a, a general overview of what is the main interpretation for Revelation chapter 13 from the position of the futurists, those people who believe that the book of Revelation is basically about the future, so it's, a, it's a prophecy about events to come, which basically will not have been unfolded before us as yet. So we are still looking for, for these things to happen. So that's the extreme end. There's another view which believes, and this is called the preterist view, that's by P R E T E R I S T, which is the belief that the book of Revelation is dealing with events of the past, very much connected to what Jesus will have revealed in his prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. Parable in 21 and 22 gave a hint of why that particular interpretation is the one that they have derived from studying Revelation, which we will draw some reference to. So, in the futuristic view, Antichrist is supposed to be an individual who comes in the future. Is to be revealed after the rapture. So that's the perspective of the three millennialists. So they're the one who have a futuristic interpretation that constitutes the, the largest percentage of evangelical Christians. They interpret Revelation to be a futuristic book. So this is why the Antichrist is the person who will be revealed in the, in the future, and he will be revealed after the rapture. We would have discussed the rapture and we would have had an understanding of the rapture. So, if that particular theology holds true, then they will be saying that after the rapture, the great tribulation, the great seven year tribulation takes place. And this is when the Antichrist reveals himself. And that's when the prophecy is fulfilled. And so, what Revelation chapter Chapter 13 indicates that some of the characteristics of the Antichrist 
will be revealed to us at that time. I gave you some indications as to how they interpret this particular antichrist is to emerge. He's going to come as a person from the revived Roman Empire. He is going to be a worldwide leader. He is going to form an alliance with the Jews in the first part of that tribulation period, which they believe is seven years. And that is connected to their understanding of Daniel chapter nine, which will deal with the seventh week of Daniel, which also indicated that we will get some time to study. And we begin to start to tie a whole lot of these things in together so we get the full drama understood and we get the correct understanding of the symbols so that we can come up with the correct interpretation. So he signs the covenant with them in the first three and a half years, and then he breaks that covenant in the second three and a half years. And he's engaged in a war and a conflict with the Jewish nation. He has an alliance with some of the surrounding Gentile nations, including armies from China and some of the, the countries in the Middle East. And they form an alliance a war against the Jews, which ends in the so-called Battle of Armageddon, which Christ comes and gives assistance to the Jews and engage in, in a war and in a conflict which destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet and brings an end to that rule and then establishes kingdom um, for a thousand years, which will be the millennial kingdom, which is part of our future study. I haven't gotten there as yet. So that was a little sort of synopsis of how they, how they view the, the emergence of the Antichrist. That's how they interpret Revelation chapter 13. There is another view, as I said, which sees Revelation 13 as an event which has already occurred what we're going to look at um, tonight. And then there's a, a third perspective, which is a sort of a middle perspective, which sees the book of Revelation as an account of the history of the church, from the time of Christ on, on, until the end, from his advent until his first advent, until his return. Um, and so they they interpret Revelation as giving a, a historical perspective of the, of the church age through that period of time. So it means that there will be some events that are close to John's time, there will be some events that will be a little after John's time, and there are some events that will unfold in the future. So that's a sort of a, a, a general perspective which embraces the two extremes. So I believe then as we try to examine each of these different perspectives, we could come to getting a, a good understanding of what the book is really saying to us, what the symbols represent, because I believe that there is a specific representation um, given in these symbols. They refer to places, they refer to people, and they represent times. And we can get the, the general drama that unfolds before us, and we can, we can have a correct understanding, and we can have the, the correct spiritual act which we can gather from the book of Revelation. So we're going to pick up from chapter 12, where we are introduced to the woman. Revelation chapter 12. From the first verse. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, 
watch that symbolism there again. And seven thrones upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. All right, watch for the symbol of the woman. Watch for the appearance of the dragon, another symbol. We have the beast, we have the dragon, we have the woman. Watch for the symbol of the seven heads and ten horns, which we saw in connection to the beast, which we saw when we went back to Daniel to establish an understanding of what the beast represents. Because remember we said that revelation is very much connected to the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it is said of all the New Testament books, revelation has the most reference to the Old Testament any of the New Testament uh, writings. And there is a lot of connection to, to Jeremiah, to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, to Daniel. And so it is important that we, we, we look back at the Old Testament where we can make connections to help us to understand what we are seeing in Revelation. Remember, this is a principle that we have established from the very beginning when we're doing hermeneutics, one of the principles is that we should look at the Old Testament to help us to understand the New Testament. We should interpret scripture upon scripture. And where there are, are difficult passages, we should try to look for passages that are even a little more simple and straightforward that will help us to understand and interpret the symbol. But of course, when we look back at the Old Testament, we want to see symbolism. We want to see figurative language, but yet we can still make the connection to Revelation that will give us some understanding. So that's where we look at Daniel and we saw reference to beasts. And we saw reference to the beast with the, with the horns, and we saw the connection to Revelation of that same empire. In Daniel, we saw that those beasts represent presented four different empires. And in Revelation chapter 13, we saw where the connection was made to those different empires and the animals which were used as symbols to represent these empires. So we see that there's a connection between what, what Daniel saw in his visions and the connection with what John saw and, and, and the bare relationship which will help us to understand uh, what is going on. Daniel would have had his revelation before John. Uh, so if we get a clear understanding from Daniel, because Daniel's images were interpreted for him by angelic beings. And so we have a clear understanding that the symbols represented in Daniel would have been what the angel told him to give us a clear understanding. And so the same parallel will come over to John. So I want us then to glance at Revelation 17, which you have for your whole assignment, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. And please, I want you to connect with me a little more. Don't be like the, the, the children, as I indicated, who on the online program very often do not connect with their teachers and say that that's one of the problems that they have to deal with in the online learning environment. My preference would have been for face to face. Uh, and I think you get the same issue with the adults in the online. We, we don't get as much feedback as, as we want. So please take the opportunity. We have time. The, the session is not rushed. And I want you to be able to, you know, to give your views. And I want you to interact because, as I indicated, it's not a lecture, it's a study. And, and we share, we bounce ideas and understandings and interpretations you know, from, from, from each other. And, and 
give us a better understanding. I want to know what you were thinking because you don't have a perspective that I may not have. You might see something that I may not see. So, so, so please interact with me. Um, have opportunity to so make statements and ask questions. Do that. Now, let's look at 17 because we're going to make a comparison because the woman is also made mention of here. And we're going to see if there's a difference on, on, on what the woman actually represents because we have to get an understanding of what the woman represents to see the connection to the beast. So chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great poor that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abomination, full of abomination, sorry, and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. We're going to stop at that point. So the angel is going to give John some understanding of, of, of this symbolism, just like the angel Gabriel gave Daniel some understanding when he would have been puzzled about what those animals represented. Now my question to you, can you engage quickly? How do you interpret the woman in Revelation 12? as compared to the woman in 17. Do you see any similarities, any differences? Who do you think the woman represents? Because we have different interpretations to the woman, just as we have different interpretations to the beast. We don't usually have a problem with the dragon and the false prophet. We usually have the variation in interpreting and understanding who the beast represents and who the woman represents. Now, tell me what is your understanding of what you read in chapter 12 and see if there is any significant um, difference between the woman in 17 and who do you think the woman represents? That's the question. So give me your response. Your assurance, I want you to be doing some interpreting as well. That's how you get into the habit that when you read now, you have to analyze what you're reading. You have to, in your own way, try to understand and interpret what, what you are seeing. So don't worry about whether you're right or wrong, or whether you're accurate or not. Tell me what you see, what you understand, when you look at the symbol of the woman. So let's look at 12, since we, we look at that one first. Uh, Reverend Jackman, I'm not sure who the person is with the galaxy, um, but that person had their hand up, the galaxy S10. Ask them to probably identify the name so that we'll get familiar with some names. Eh? Sorry about that, Rev. I, I forgot. There's a Randy. I forgot to change it. 
Yes, okay. <laughs> so that I will change it afterwards. Okay. Let me engage you, Reverend Jackman, because it says, and they appear a wonder in heaven. Yes. I think the woman, I think the woman here represents the church in her primitive glory. Then mm -hmm. I, that's why I think that the church, the woman represents the church, the sun in her primitive glory. Okay, and the crown on her head, I think would have represented the the would have representation of the twelve apostles. Yeah. So that that's why that's why I think about it. And she right. and she sure. and she be Cho. Some people believe that this Cho represent Jesus, but I do not think so. Jesus is not a child of the church. I think this child represents the number of persons who would have been born into the church, who, who, who would have been born into the church. But as I said, it's a school of thought where some people believe that this woman in travail represent Christ, but I don't think so. Then there's a prophecy in Jerry, I think Jerry Mel Isaiah with it. Can a nation be born in one day? I can't remember the exact scripture. It speaks about yeah, kind of new it said, it as soon as she travailed, she brought forth. Right. She brought forth, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's my thinking of it. All right, and, and your 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 thinking is one of the positions that that has been exposed as an interpretation to that, and that's the position that many of our theologians um, also view. But there are other interpretations, so I want to hear if anybody comes up with a different view or can see um, a different interpretation of the symbol. Or rather, so that's a very good interpretation. Uh, and that's one that is common among our millennialists. Not all our millennialists will support that position, but many of them do. But there, there are other perspectives. Our theologians are inclined to support that particular interpretation. All right, let's see if there are any others who will agree with you or come up with a different interpretation. Anybody disagree with Randy or, 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 or has a different interpretation of that, that symbol? And ask yourself the question then, um, is, the, is the woman in Revelation 17 then also connected to the church? Because remember we indicated that the symbols must hold consistent. If the beast represents a particular person, then we have to carry that symbol throughout. If the beast represents a particular kingdom, then we have to carry that symbol throughout. So if the woman represents church, we have to see now how the application follows in the, the, the other chapter as it pertains now to the church. So that will give you something to reflect on in relation to what Randy said. So, so please give me some, some more comments. I know you're just children, so you were thinking, yes. Yeah, we have Ian, Ian Innes. So he Ian has Innes. either a comment or a question, yeah? Or, and, and please, it's good to hear the pastors, but I, I, I want to hear some of the lay persons because I, I want to see how our people are thinking. So please don't let the pastors do all the interpreting. I think they have a good understanding. I want, I want as well other individuals who are not pastors to, to get in and give me some feedback. All right, Ian, let me hear you. All right, good evening again, Reverend Jackman. I am I am wondering what the the number, the 1260 days, um, where does this fit in? And if it has a significant role to play in the interpretation that we are looking at. Yes, it does. It very, it very much does, and, and, and we, will, we will get to that. Now, you will notice that we have three times mentioned. We saw some of them already. We saw 42 months. We saw three and a half years. We saw in Daniel a time, times, and the dividing of time. That also appears in Revelation. We will see it. All right? I remember we said in, in, in the prophetic um, language, a time represented a year, 
times will be two years, and the dividing of time will be half a year. So technically, that will come to three and a half years. So we see a parallel in, in Daniel making reference to three and a half years. We see it mentioned in Revelation, and we see it more than once, and we see all of those specific times mentioned. Three and a half years, 42 months, a time, times, and the dividing of time, and 1260 days. Now, if you carry all of those todays, you will come to 1260 using the 30 day a month, which was the way the Jews' um, time scale worked. According to the Jewish um, time signal that we were having the Bible, a month was 30 days. So 30 by 12 would give us, um, sorry, 30, 30 days in, in each month. And then we have three and a half years or 42 months that will bring us to 1260 days. Now, there are people that would interpret that literally to mean 1260 days or three and a half years or 42 months. And the others now will carry that to the other prophetic extent in that you take now each day for a year and you will represent that now to be 1260 years. And when you go to Daniel, you will also see the application of, 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 of weeks as years in prophetic time. And you will see where the application occurs. So yes, Ian, that 1260 is significant, but it depends on how the interpretation is made. When we look at the persons who see Revelation as an interpretation of an event that has taken place already, they would go for three and a half years. And they would, I will show you why they will go for three and a half years. Some of the persons who will take the 1260 days in a prophetic application, each day representing a year, make it 1260 years will show you how they connect that to future time relating to the papacy when the pope first came on the scene when the pope was removed off the scene that would have come for that 1260 years i will explain that a little more but yes the answer to your question is correct ian that that has a significance in understanding the prophecy and the prophetic time scale because events are connected to time we also have to get the times right and times are often very given in, in in a symbolic representation or sometimes they are given specific so i answer yes to that uh, you have another comment or question rev from um sophia h i suspect that's sophia holder not sure yes please uh, yes please yes good evening Good evening to you. I, I would have missed out a few studies, yes. but from what we are discussing tonight, mm -hmm. my interpretation, subject to correction, of chapter 12, I'm yes. seeing the woman as the nation of Israel, the stars as the 12 tribes, yes. and she is giving birth to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. And um, I guess when it speaks from verse three pertaining to the dragon and stuff, I guess when we read in the New Testament, there's the account where um, the enemy wanted to destroy, well, he wanted to kill Jesus through Pharaoh and those per persons. Yes. So I'm not sure if that is referring to that because it says then that the son was caught up to God and to his throne and that's where Christ is. So then the nation of Israel is still there in the wilderness basically up to this day. That's my interpretation. Thank you. That's very, that's very good. You were, you were wondering if, if your, your interpretation was correct. That's, that's a very good interpretation. As a matter of fact, these are the only two interpretations that are already given in relation to that, to that woman, symbolically, that she represents, as Randy says, the church, and, and she represents um, Israel, as you indicated, and we can see where the application can apply. 
and they gave the good application in that it, it could be the church and the, and the 12 stars will represent the 12 disciples. And we're going to see how that is connected as we move on to other aspects in, in Revelation. And that the, the man child did not literally represent a child, but represent the offspring, which means the church is, is giving birth um, to the people who accept Christ like on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls were added in one day, and that's the prophecy that, that Randy never referenced to when, it, when the question was, uh, can Zion um, bring forth? As soon as she travailed, she brought forth. And, and one day, basically, there were 3,000 souls added. And some people believe that that was the prophecy fulfilled in relation to that statement that, that, that Randy uh, had alluded to. Now, nobody may reference to the seven heads and the ten horns. But your application with Israel now, the woman then will be Israel, and the 12 crowns, or, or 12, yes, or crowns, 12 stars, will be the 12 tribes, and the child would be Jesus, the offspring, which, which Randy would have disagreed with, and that there was persecution. There was an attempt. To get rid of the child. Historically, we, we, can, we can say now what we're here doing, we are looking at symbols and we are seeing how the application can be made because the symbols must make sense. It's just the edge of our always book. We could see what, what the animals were connected to and we could see who they represent. In, in the same way, in, in, in Revelation, we have to be able to see the connection if the interpretation is going to be able to hold them. And we have to see what symbols we apply to. So, so both of those are very good interpretation. Um, and both of them could be correctly applied. Now we have to, to look at a little more detail and see which now will have a more significant application. So the seven heads and ten horns, which nobody made reference to, who is after the woman or after the child. Anybody remembers what we recognize as this as this symbolism connected to the seven heads and ten horns? Anybody remember how we connected that to, to what Daniel saw and how it connects to what John is seeing in Revelation? That is that is significant. Let me say if your good students are remembering, once who were here last week should be able to make a connection. Anybody can make that connection? Uh, Rev, Randy's in again. Yes. Uh-huh. Randy again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Randy Johnson. I, I think they refer to the, the, the seven heads and ten horns refer to the seven forms of government. Yes. That, at that time were ruling the world. And up to the time when John was written, I yes. think eight of them, if, I'm, if I speak correctly, would have being passed on, eight of, eight, eight of those different forms of government. I can't, I can't remember the names of the other two, but up to the time that he was written, that he wrote, history says there was that at least eight of those different forms of government were passed yes. over. And then at that time ruling was the, the, the dragon, the dragon. And then mm -hmm. after the dragon knew a new agent was going to be defeated, the Bible say the dragon hand its power now to the beast. The dragon turned around. And the beast now was a different form of government that still turned around and afflict the people of God. And I, and I just wanted to skip forward to 17. Because 17 uh -huh. again, 17 again, because you asked about that. Thoughts yes. about Another woman, this another woman now, represented the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church. We ain't really, but we talk, we, we talk about speak blasphemy things and they try to destroy, they drunk with the saints' blood. And history tells us again that that system destroyed a lot of Christians, killed them, they were drunk with the blood of the saints that same system. So if, if you carry forward the symbol then, the symbol in Revelation chapter 17 
is speaking now to a, a, another church, another city, but not a good church, a church that turned around and destroy and try to destroy out the way for Christianity. All right. Okay, Randy, I see I see that you're doing some reading that's very good, and I'm getting some good feedback. So like I see, please. Um, and, and, and I like this. Um, very, very good interpretations. Uh, what we have to bear in mind, Randy, is that if you if you say the woman represents the church, if she represents the church in, in chapter 12, the, the symbol has to carry forward and she will have to represent the church in chapter 17. Okay. Really, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a different church, but mm -hmm. it's a church, it's a church that has a different look and a different image, but it okay. is still the church. The symbol is the symbol of the church. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Your chapter 12 will be the woman, as you say, in the pristine glory, the church in, 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 its, in its best beginnings. Okay. It's the, it's the pure church. It, it's the glorious church. Because she has, she's clothed with the sun and the moon on her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. That's the church in the beginning, in the first, the first century church, in its beginning stages, which will be considered as a, as a pure church. Now, in Revelation 17, that was still a church, but you see a different description. And that is what the theologians who support your particular perspective, Randy, will say is the apostate church. They were connected to Roman Catholicism, yes, but still the church, still the church. And, and the fact that the woman is riding on the beast, that's what you want. I want other people to feed in and, and I want to see how you're thinking so that we can link these symbols together and see how they unfold the drama. So the seven, um, the, the seven heads and 10 horns, we, we strike back to, to Daniel. I remember that kingdom was the fourth kingdom which represented the Roman Empire. And, and I will want you to read Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 9 is going to be a little more difficult uh, for you to understand unless we get some explanation. But Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8 deals with the kingdoms and the representation. Daniel 2 deals with it from the image that Nebuchadnezzar um, saw, and, and, the, and, the, and, and God gave Daniel the interpretation. And he gave them the kingdoms. The, the beautiful thing about the study of prophecy, and that's why it's, it's important for us to get a good understanding. Because when we can explain prophecy and we see the connection and we see the drama unfold, we see the parallels, and we see how, how things are fulfilled. As I indicated before, it gives credibility to the Bible. It, it gives a, a witness to the fact that, that this is authentic, it is of God, it's revealed the man from God. The source of all we have in the Bible, as Paul says, all inspiration is given by God. It's profitable for doctrine. So all we read throughout the Bible, all the drama that unfolds, all the story that is told, it comes from the mind of God that has been revealed to us through the, the, the prophets and, and through the record that we have. And, and there's no holy book that can match the Bible in terms of the prophecies and the fulfillment of the prophecies. There were over 300 prophecies related to Jesus and every one of them were fulfilled in detail. And all the prophecies you see connected to the Bible were fulfilled. What we're looking at in terms of Revelation is prophecy. We're looking at the time that it was fulfilled, but there's definitely a fulfillment. All of these symbols that are used here have a specific time or a specific representation and it shows the beauty of the book. That's why it gets so excited excited when I'm studying the Bible because it, it shows how, how powerful a revelation we have and it has to be that it, uh, it's a God-inspired book and it, and, it, and it speaks despite what people might think of our, our faith and belief in, in, in a supreme being, this Bible is evidence that it has to be a God because there's no human being who could see prophecy um, 500 years uh, ahead of the time and could be fulfilled in such accuracy. So this is a, is a short testament um, to the word of God so, and, and to the existence of God. So when we right. study it, so this is, is, is the strength that we have to present to the world, that we have faith and confidence in this because it, 
have to be death inspired by the God that we believe in. All right, Reverend, go back to our Reverend, interpretations. Reverend now, Jackman. Yes. What, what between Revelation 12 and 17, because yes. we are seeing two different things, what right. would have caused, my question is, what would have caused, you, you see in Revelation 12, a woman clothed with the sun, all of glory and church. But then you see in Revelation 17, a woman, a yes. church, you know, that as, let me say, turn back. Yes. What, what, would have, what would have caused the writer to describe the church in 17 like that? Very good question. Very good question. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 16. Remember we said that, that very much of what is written, written in Revelation has a connection to the Old Testament. I remember the inspiration is coming from the same source. The revelation is coming from the same place. What the prophets were inspired with and the inspiration that they were being given is coming from the same source that Daniel's, sorry, that, that John's inspiration is coming from. So that's why you have to, to, to look and see the connection. So Ezekiel, let's look back at Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel 16, sorry, Ezekiel 16. Now, this, this is beginning to, to, to pan out like study, right? We we're getting some questions and getting some information. 16, let's pick up from the first verse. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, See where the inspiration is coming from? It is the word of the Lord, and it comes. Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. Now, this is going to come up, connect very much to what the, the, the other person said, that, that the symbol could represent Israel. And that's what we're going to be looking at in terms of the interpretation as a past, as an event that occurred. It is going to be very much connected to what we read in Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to see how all ties in, how the, the story on for the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter, uh, verse 8. I, I'm just going to pick out sections of it so we don't have to read the whole of Ezekiel. Now, when we pass by thee and look upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. I spread my spirit over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yeah. I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, said the Lord, and thou becamest mine. This is God speaking to Jerusalem. That, that's that's the, 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 the past Jerusalem. That's the, the covenant relationship which we had with the children of Israel. So when you see Jerusalem mentioned, that was considered as the, as the holy city. But it is speaking of the children of Israel as the covenant God had with them. Listen to what happened. Said then I washed thee with water. I thoroughly washed away the, the blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee with, with, with broidered work, and showed thee with badger skin. I girded thee with fine linen, and covered thee with silk. Takes the description of the woman in 12, a glorious woman representing the church, as you said, or it could be representing Israel, God's covenant people. The church is also God's covenant people. That's what I'm saying. The symbol can apply the book and we can see where the application can flow. I remember the church became, or uh, I should say, former Israel became the church. Verse 11, I deck thee also with ornaments. I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ear. And a beautiful crown, watch it, upon thy head. Thou was decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey with oil, and thou was exceedingly beautiful, and did prosper into a kingdom. Verse 15. But thou distrust in thine own beauty, 
and play the harlot because of their renown and pour us out by fornication on everyone that passed by. His it was. 17. Thou hast also taken the fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I have given thee, and made us to thyself images of men, and this commit pour them, watch the language, pour them with them, and took us thy broidered garments and covered them, and thou hast set my oil and my incense before them. Verse 20, moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and hast sacrificed them to be devoured. In this of the whoredoms, a small matter, thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them, and in all the abominations and thy whoredom, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, when thou was naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood, and it came to pass after thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord. Verse 28, thou hast played the whore also with the Syrians, because thou was unsatiable, yea, thou hast played the heart out with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Verse 37, behold, therefore I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved. With all them that has thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about thee, and will discover the nakedness unto them, that they may see all the nakedness, and I will judge thee as the woman that breaketh bedlock and shed blood are judged. I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. I will also give thee into their hand, and they shall throw down the enemy place, and shall break down the high places, and they shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take they fear jewels and leave thee naked and bare. They shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones and trust thee too with the swords, and they shall burn thy houses with fire, watch language, and execute judgment upon thee in the sight of many women. I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou also shalt give no her any more. All right, now, Randy, do you make any connection with chapter 17 from what you just read? Yes, yes. You, you see, you know, I know I, I, I didn't get a chance to read Ezekiel, but I'm saying it now because you, you see the contrast somebody in the primitive glory where God would have dressed them and did this and did that for them. And then after just, if, if the scripture comes to mind too, when God said to them, look, I'm going to clothe, say to the children of Israel, I'm going to clothe you. He said, be careful, lest when you start to do A, B, and C, you forget God. And, and, and that happened also, we, that can be, that can come in as one of the, if we can use that as in one of the analogies, where the children of Israel, God blessed them mightily. And God yes. said to them, look, be careful. When you start to build holes and you start to increase, and you start to do this, then you're going to forget me. And then as, as you read it, you're able now to pick up the, the, the train of thoughts and see the contrast where God decked them, God. And as then they turn their backs on God. And then when they do that, God said, this is what is not, I'm going to allow to happen to you. So I know I, I'm seeing it now. Right. So, 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 so there's a parallel. There's a connection between the two interpretations. You gave one. And the other lady that that, um, that gave her opinion, um, um, both of, of you give very, very good interpretation and there's a connection. Because what one of these is showing in that symbolism is that the church started out in pristine glory. But then came the apostasy to Roman Catholicism and the church fell away in, into what the Bible would describe as whoredom, lost its connection from God just as the children of Israel. So that's where the application can also apply to Israel. And we're going to see how now in terms of time schedule, how it relates to what Jesus said in relation to, to Israel, because that also can be a very, very sound interpretation in that, that what is, was written in Revelation was to soon come to pass. Because the prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24, remember that took place in AD 70, and that would be very much connected to the time that John was, 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 in a, was in a life and, and enduring from the experience. 
So Ezekiel is showing how Israel, that's an interpretation if the woman represents Israel, that, that Israel was also the, 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 the chosen for God because the bride then, that adorned in, 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 her, in her pristine state, but she fell away. I was described then as, 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 a, as a woman gone off the order and giving herself the abominations, getting involved in idolatrous practices. So there could be a very heavy connection. We're going to see how the application applies to both the church. And we will see more of that when we look then at the, the historical aspect where the church turns away from God into Roman Catholicism. We're not going to look at that tonight. What we're going to look at now is if it represents Israel, we're going to see how the application could definitely apply to Israel. I remember Israel is, is, the, is the future church. The, the, the church is a, is a symbolic representation of Israel. We are the, of the sea of Abraham. Spiritual Israel, then the church became spiritual Israel because that Israel, which was supposed to be in a shining glory, showing forth the light of God and being an example to the nations, was led away by the very nations that aim to, 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 to um, idolatrous practice and abomination. And that would fit the description of the woman in chapter 17. So we're going to look at it from that perspective and see how it can apply to Israel. And then that would show how revelation could be very much connected to what Jesus would have described in, 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 in chapter 24. So we're going to look at that briefly and we will close on that tonight. Then we will look then at the third aspect where we bring the historical element. So we, will, we have the Antichrist, which is the future. We now have this particular section, the woman related to, to Israel. And then the third one will be where the woman is living the church, how the church has been in the apostasy, how the, the, the papacy got power, and we'll see how that represents. And both of them are, are, are very strong uh, applications and interpretations. So let's look at... at, at uh, Rev, yes, Rev, just yes, before sir. we get there, um, there's either a comment or question from both um, Ian and Randy. So I'll, uh, I'll allow Ian to go first. And yes, then, and then Randy. So Ian, go ahead. I, I, I'm still hearing only pastors again. <laughs> Apart from that, you only will give that beautiful interpretation. I, I want to hear some more. Go ahead, Ian first. Yes, yes, yes. yes Thank Ian. you, Reverend Jatwin. Um, yes, I'm listening to you here, and I am wondering, can yes. we can we bring what Hosea went through with Gomer into this discussion and? As you were talking about how the Bible is so beautiful and how it comes together. Yes, yes, it, yes, very, very much so. Very much so. Hosea has the application, and I will give you some other parts you can read. Isaiah 54, 1 to 6, Jeremiah chapter 3. Read the whole of Ezekiel 16. You will get a good understanding. I just read parts to pick out specific elements they want to look at. And Hosea chapter 2 in particular. 19 to 20, but read those. Those give you a representation of Israel chosen as God's bride, having a covenant relationship with, with them, but they fell away. And that's why Jesus said, I, I left for you. Remember, remember in the New Testament, Paul said, if, if, if the unbelieving wants to go, let, let that person go. He didn't speak of divorce. He says, let them go. If that's what they want to do, let them go. What God did is that he let unbelieving Israel, who he had chosen as his wife, but they wanted another person in charge of their life. They wanted another relationship with the paganism and hedonism, and they went into abomination and give themselves to other um, persons, and God released them. But he was always reaching out as a loving husband, forgiving them and bringing them back. Going back to the same place again. He forgave them and he bring them back. He isn't about divorcing them. But there comes a point now when they have gone so far. And we will see what, what happens and how the interpretation is connected to what, what happened to Jerusalem. And that's why I told you 
to read the parable in, in Matthew chapter 22. All right, the parable in Matthew chapter 22. And I'm, I'm going to just glance back at that to show the connection here as we form the link. Matthew chapter 22. Quote with a very good work. He says, in my favor, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. Now come to Randy, which made a marriage for his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they will not come. Again, he sent forth another servant, saying, Tell them which are, are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings, and kill all things that be ready. But they made light of it. They went their ways, one to his farm, etc., and the remnant. His servant took and, and treated them spitefully and slew them. When the king heard thereof, he was wrong, and he sent forth his armies, and he destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Watch that. Then he said to his servant, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. And the other one at 21 he says, For verse 33, hear another parable. There was a certain household which planted a vineyard and edge around the boat. Dig a wine press in it and built a tower, led it up to his husbandman and went into a far country. And when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandman took his servants, beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise. But the last he sent unto them his son, saying they reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come and let us kill him. Let us seize him of the inheritance. And verse 4, who Jesus said, Did you not remember that the stone which the bitter rejected the same is becoming hate? This is the Lord's doing, and his marvelous life. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth food thereof. What I said to you when we look at Matthew chapter 24 is that that destruction represented a taking of the kingdom away from the Jews, giving it to the Gentiles. Now, let me hear you, Brother Randy. There's just one question I would like to ask, because I know we are discussing, but is there any lesson that the church, or we, the Church of Christ, can take from it, especially chapter 17? Yes. Is there any lessons that we can especially take from it? There are lessons we can take from 17. There are lessons that we can take from 12. There are lessons that we can take as a matter of fact from the whole of Revelation. What 17 indicates to us is that you, you can go away from God depending on the connections that you make. So now let's, let's look at 17. And there came one of the servants, one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So the, 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 the judgment taking place here. We will look at it in the future as representing the church, but we deal with it now as Israel, because we're looking at the interpretation that, that Revelation is dealing with the past. It is dealing with the judgment of Israel that took place in AD 70 because Christ has now rejected them because they did not fulfill the purpose. Watch what happens here with the woman. The woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a gold cup in her hand full of abomination and of her fornication. She looked well. But upon her head, upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore they don't marvel, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her which have the seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads and ten horns, remember we said, represents the Roman Empire. It is pagan Rome. 
it would be, it would be the same um, prayer that was present when Jesus came into the world. If we also look at it in connection with the, with the, with the Jews, pagan Rome is what is controlling the Jews. Remember, we pointed out that, that Rome um, took um, the, the, the Jerusalem into captivity from about 1853, Pompey overtaking uh, Rome. But Israel formed an alliance with Rome. So this is symbolic here of the woman riding on the beast. The beast represents Rome. Israel is in an alliance with Rome, and that's why they had civil war, because some of the Jews were for Romans and some were against. But there were many of the children of Israel that sided with Rome. Rome had power and authority, and the beast was raiding, and the woman was raiding on Rome. So, so Israel is in an alliance with Rome, and she is allowing Rome, pagan Rome, to take control and possession of her. So she's, she's going to be following their customs, and she's going to, to, to be obedient to, 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 to their dictates. She has fallen away from the, the, the glory that she would have had when she followed um, God in the covenant relationship. But now she's she is a mystery woman. And upon her forehead was the name written Mystery Babylon the Great, Boy Babylon, because she's connected with some of the same practices that came from Babylon that was incorporated in Rome. So that's where the connection to Babylon comes. So it, it's, it's a spiritual falling away here that has taken place with Israel because of her connection to Rome and her connection to Babylon, because Babylon also came in, in, in connection with Rome. Notice she had on her forehead, now according to the Roman culture, the prostitutes in Rome used to carry a band on their forehead with their name inscribed in it. So this is why the woman here is compared um, in, in, that, in, in that sense. So Israel is now described as, as, as a woman going astray from the covenant relationship with God. She is riding with, with the beast. So she's, she's in harmony with, with the beast. And it says, sir, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw a woman with great admiration, Rome, Rome slaughtered. And, 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 and Israel, Israel joined with that in the slaughter of many Christians that, that, that accepted Christ. And, and, and Nero, who was one of the persons that was in power when, when John was writing, was responsible for the slaughter of, of a lot of Christians. So, so this is showing how the, the, the whole connection here um, is made. So it is saying to us that if we, if we get connected so the, the pagan world, if we, if, that's why he said, John said, love not the world or the things that are in the world. So we get connected to, to, the, to the Romans and the, and the practices. Remember, a lot of the Jews did what the Romans wanted them to do to get power. They, they recognized that their positions were very much connected um, to the Roman authority. And, and they did things to stay in power with the Romans. And we, we, we saw that coming out in, in scripture in the Acts of the Apostles. They, they, they say, we have no king but Caesar. And they said, let the blood be on us. Give us Barabbas. So, so Rome became, became the authority. And they crucified Jesus. That's, that's what the parable meant. He sent his, the, the prophets to them. They wouldn't listen to the prophets. And then the son came and they crucified the son. So all of this is paralleling with, with, with Israel and, and the past. So what John would be seeing then is an unfolding of what Jesus described. This city, this Jerusalem, that Israel that has fallen away from the covenant promise is going to be given over to judgment. And the very people that it aligned itself with, the very pagans that it aligned themselves with are going to be the ones that will destroy them and judge them. Because remember, Rome, Rome had a lot of, of persons in their army from Gentile countries. So it was an alliance of, of the same Gentiles that, that, that Jew, the Jews get to be in their abominations with that were the very ones that would destroy them. 
quickly for you, Stefan Raf. Um, just yes. want to acknowledge some comments that were in the chat. Um, we would have some comments um, with regard to both points of view. Um, the EDs would have indicated um, read Ezekiel 16, verse 1, then 8 to 41, speaking about the woman, the church yes. in Revelation 12. She went from glory yes. to destruction. The church yes. forgot God, God as they began to prosper. The Roman Catholic Church turns away from God. They were yes. to be a shining light and moved away from God to idolatry. There's a yes. parallel in Revelation 12 and again in Revelation 17. So that's yes. from the point of view of the woman being in the church. And then we had Kellen, uh, from the view where the woman is Israel, she was saying um, uh, Israel, which is, was blessed and anointed in the Old Testament, will be the same woman in the New Testament. So for the fall of Israel, a consequence, so the fall of Israel was a consequence of the fall of the church in Revelation. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, somebody wanted the scriptures that I, I gave, I wanted to read, I would, I would give them again. Isaiah 54, 1 to 6. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 20. But you can read the whole of Jeremiah, but 20 was a very specific verse. Ezekiel chapter 16, Hosea chapter 2, 19 to 20. All right, let me give the interpretation the angel gave to Daniel, sorry, not to Daniel, to John about this woman that will give us some understanding of how to be connected to the past. The angel said unto me, Wherefore, this thou marvel, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, of the beast that carrieth her, which have the seven heads and ten horns. So you see, we're going to get an interpretation in the book itself. And it's going to come from an angel, which is the same thing that happened in Daniel's case. He got an interpretation that was given to him because the, the symbolism, you know, was, was causing some sort of, of um, consternation. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, you will ask yourself, but angel, now that interpretation still has me confounded. I still don't have a clue what you're talking about. So we now have to still interpret what the angel is saying, but it gives us an understanding. So the beast that thou sawest was and is not. It is making reference to a past, and it is not. Remember, the, the woman had the mother of, she had mystery Babylon. So, so, so Babylon was, it's a city that is no longer, it is, it is destroyed. But, but, but yet it is, meaning that there are still elements of Babylon, there are still practices. Remember, we read from Ezekiel that the Israelites were offering their children. They, they were engaged in, in, in the type of worship and abomination that was practiced by even the Babylonians. So this is where the angel is saying the beast was and, 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 and was not and yet is. So, 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 so Babylon, in, in, in a way, is past as a historical um, city but it is still present in a sense in that there are characteristics that are still connected to how this beast and this woman are operating. Obviously, those persons who are not written in the book of life are people then who are not controlled by the spirit of God, and then they are the ones that will be caught up in these abominations which are being practiced. And she said, and here, the angel said, and here is the mind which have wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Seven mountains, again, is symbolic because Rome was described as the city on seven hills. Or you could, you could say seven mountains. That's, that's what Rome was referred to in, in the ancient times. And even, you know, in, in more modern times, Rome was referred to as the city 
on, on seven hills. So you're seeing room coming in to play here again. The woman is in harmony and in alliance with Rome. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, this is something that historically happened. The, the kings that were fallen, five were fallen, would have been Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, Gaius, and Claudius. And, and, and Paul, Paul even had a dealing with, 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 with Claudius. So these are, are, are the five that would have fallen, meet that they had died. And one is, which is Nero. So Nero was the one that was present when John was writing, and Nero was the one that began the persecution of the Christians. Nero was the one that burned the Christians um, as a form of, of giving light for his parties. Nero was the one that, that, that burned the city because he wanted a, a rebellion project, and then he blamed the Christians for it, and that's where the persecution started, and, and, and Christians were, were, were slaughtered. I, I think Paul and Peter were, were martyred um, on, under, under Nero's reign. So we can see where the historical application here that the, that the angel is giving the interpretation and it is connected to Rome. The, the, the emperors, their kings, fallen, and one is to come. And when he comes, he will reign for a short while. The one that is to come is the one that would have followed after Nero, and he, he reigned for just about six months. Remember that, that Nero would have committed um, suicide. He, 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 he died by the same sword. He, he committed suicide with his, with his own sword. Now, Nero would have started his persecution in about June or November of 1864, and he died November 1864, he died in 1868, which is approximately three and a half years, 42 months, 160 days, time, times, and the dividing of time. That's the connection. So, so the, the, the theologians who are of, of that belief that what John is describing is the same thing that Jesus would have prophesied would have happened to Jerusalem. That destruction would come on them and it happened in AD 70. And here is a, is, is a is a connection to, to, to that period of, of time which John was saying. So they shortly come to pass and the time is near. The people who are of this theological persuasion, they are amillennialists, yes, but they're, they, they don't interpret it in the same way that our theologians who are also amillennialists interpret it. They saw it as past. Our theologians saw it as pertaining to a, a, a coming time that was relatively close to John, but it was going to be in the future. That was where we see the, the, uh, the beast represented the, the pagan practices of Roman Catholicism, which we will look at in more detail. But this is the interpretation which looks at Revelation as an account of the past. So the new Jerusalem that John saw coming down would have been the bride but if you, if you look at the description, I will give you a little more detail on that um, when we get in the next section because it will take a little more explanation to go into it now. So we will continue to look at how that connection plays out. So the old Jerusalem or the old city refers to the old covenant relationship God had with the Jews. And after the city and the temple was destroyed, a new relationship is established. The kingdom is taken from them and given to the Gentiles. And so the church age now, which is ushered in, is a new covenant, which will involve, yes, the, the, the Israelites as well, but the more of the persons that make up that church now are Gentiles. The covenant relationship is a relationship now with the Gentiles. So, so the Jews were rejected because they failed to maintain their, their covenant relationship with Christ. So the new Jerusalem that John saw, even though we interpret that, to me, the final consummation that that was the end. These persons who interpret Revelation as past see that as the new Jerusalem, meaning now it is the new covenant relationship, the new church age, because the old Jerusalem had now been destroyed in 1870 
and God is establishing a new covenant, which is the church age, and that's the new Jerusalem. So the, the, the parallel woman would have passed and passed away because notice that the beast will turn on the woman as well. So we will look at that in more detail when we come to our next section. I'll finish off the interpretation here of the revelation being a past and related to the account that took place in AD 70. And then we will want to look at it in relation to the woman as the church falling away from her Christian glory into apostasy on the Roman Catholicism. And we want to see how that connection plays out in terms of the beast and in terms of the woman. Because those are, are the important symbols in this whole drama. Once we get them on the symbol, we will get an understanding of how the ground plays out, and what meaning we can gather from it, and what application we, we can make to ourselves as, as a church, how we can see the future being, being applied to what this, this drama reveals to us. So I'll, I'll pause there if anybody wants to make any final comment or ask any question before we close off. I hope we are beginning to see how, how the figurative language begins to tie in together once we start to understand the symbols and see the connection between the Old Testament and what John is seeing, and also see the connection between what Jesus prophesied, what John saw in his vision, how they are connected. All right, we have something coming from Ian. Yes. Uh I just wanted to say thank you, Reverend Jackman, for the wonderful job that you're doing. I was sitting here tonight and I'm listening to all of this information. And I remember just before it began, I yes. attended what they call a, a, a multi faith service that they had at one. I think they were doing the regathering thing at the time. Yes. And we, we there, there was this huge service that they had this particular Sunday. So it was. Saint um, Watchman Hall that evening, and there were people there from Rastafari, the Baha'i faith, Muslims, and all of these people. And I remember they had given each faith the opportunity to do a reading and share um, their belief. Yes. And I remember that the Christians started heckling the Muslims and the Rastas and so on as they were doing their sharing. And while we were having our time, of them sat down very quietly and listened attentively. Yeah. And I remember turning around and, and speaking to some Christians that were behind me and saying, this is not the way. Because if you are supposed to be trying to win them over, you're not going to do that by insulting them and, and, and degrading them and demean what they're doing. Look how yeah. politely they sat and listened to us as we gave our exposition of our faith and now we are laughing at them. And I couldn't help but think of that verse of scripture that is in 1 Peter 4, verse 17, that talks about, for it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And I just wanted to leave that with us tonight. Thank you, Reverend um, Jackman. Thank you for that. Right. We, 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 that's very, we're very understanding of uh, people's perspective and their, and their views. And yes, we were traitors. Help them to understand why we believe what we believe, but it, it is not a, a way of, of trying to make you know, people look uh, so far removed from, from, from God or anything that, that makes common sense. We see is how people interpret the, the word, how they understand, the, how they understand the purpose of God. And so far as us, see, if we don't get the drama and the storyline, we, we, we can miss what we need to understand. I just think that sometimes. Other faiths that, that have maybe not got the full understanding of, of, the, of the story that the Bible is telling from Genesis to Revelation. And, and that is why they might have come up with a different position than we have because they might not have understood the full story. Uh, right, it's just uh, like, sorry, it's just like somebody watching a, 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 a movie coming on to the end and not get the full storyline and then try to interpret what the story might have made. See, you have to get the full picture, or you can come up with a wrong understanding of, of what the movie represents. Yes, Jeff. 
Yeah, we have uh, either a comment or question from Sophia Holder. Yes, please. Reverend Jackman, you would have mentioned um, how the nation of Israel were practicing some of the Babylonian practices. Yes. Will you be touching on what the church, what Babylonian practices the church may be practicing next week yes. when you address that? Very much so. You see, because if you look at it at the church, remember, if there's a connection between the dragon, the beast, uh, and, and, and the, the, the application to the church. So, yes, there, there are practices that are still even in the church today that are connected to the paganism. Remember, the dragon gave power to the beast, the beast passed on. Um, the dragon gave its power to the beast, and the beast passed on that, 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 that power to the, to, the, to the papacy. And if the beast represents the Roman Empire, yes, there are things that came through Babylon into Rome, into the church. And yes, you will see some of those things which are still even being practiced today because of the lengths that the papacy had in the Romanism. Thank you. Yes, sure. All right, Jeff, that should be it for me. Um, and thank you very much. You were very more engaged tonight. That was very, very good. And we hope that I will continue in the next session because we have a lot more interesting things to come. Remember, you still have to understand the connection to the Mark and Beast 666, how it applies. If you're looking at it as a past event, how it will connect to Nero. If you're looking at it as a future event, how it connect to the Pope, or how it will connect to the Antichrist. So those are, are things that we also engage ourselves in understanding go a little deeper into this study. Thank you very much and God bless you and have a good night.